Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the School of Global and International Studies. Welcome to our uh, friends and uh, partners from uh, Washington, D.C. at uh, the National Endowment uh, of Democracy and uh, from other, other uh, places as well. We're live streaming, so uh, what you say and do can and will be seen uh, worldwide. <laughs> I just want to uh, set the tone for our, for our conversation today and thank you all, all of you for uh, cutting class uh, or uh, whatever you're done to join us today for, for this afternoon. The Washington Post of last year added a line to its masthead, democracy dies in darkness. It's stark and a little bit melodramatic with all that alliteration but it points to a concept fundamental to democratic principles in this country and globally. The subject of our conference today is not only about darkness, but also about fog. Uh, it's a fog enabled by new technologies, aided and supported by corruption and regulatory power. It's the fog of media capture and disinformation. Of course, uh, efforts to control and intimidate journalists are nothing new. Uh, familiar methods of repression remain effective, and they continue to be used. Uh, just a couple of days ago, that, that same Washington Post uh, reported on the imprisonment in December of uh, two journalists, Wa Lone and Kiwa Soet O of uh, Burma, Myanmar, who were imprisoned not for the formal reason of their uh, stated reason for violating the Official Secrets Act, but rather uh, for an investigation they did into the uh, government-sponsored and implemented mass atrocities in Rakhine State in Western Burma, which the United Nations has described as a textbook case of ethnic cleansing, and you can check out their investigation, which Reuters reported uh, on and published uh, February 8th. This afternoon, we will focus on the new efforts to control, manipulate, and intimidate the media and others who seek to have a voice and influence the course of their lives, societies, and governments. And this new effort is aptly captured by our conference title, Media Capture, Disinformation, and Democracy. First panel, we'll look at the ways in which these new methods work and how they're applied. And the second panel will focus on what organizations and people, people like you and me, people like us, can and are doing about it. Our panelists include scholars, policy practitioners, and democracy activists. And I wanted to do a call out uh, to, uh, uh, in particular, to the National Endowment for Democracy, Reagan Facel Fellows, who are with us today, democracy activists from the Philippines, Maxine Tanya Hamada, and from Hungary, Gabor Schering. Well, welcome to you both, uh, and thank you for joining us. And of course, we're very privileged to have as our partner uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, and to be joined by Carl Gershman, its president. Uh, in our third panel, I'll have the chance to uh, have a conversation with Carl uh, and ask him to look at the big, bigger picture of the state of global democracy. What do we think is going on and why? And I'll say more about Mr. Gershman then. This panel is a partnership between NED and SGIS that we began in 2015. And this is our second annual co-sponsored conference. The first took place on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. We also co-sponsor a postdoctoral fellowship the uh, inaugural Mark Helmke postdoctoral scholar on global media development and democracy is Dr. Elizabeth Stein to my right, and she will uh, give us the benefit of some of her research on the first panel. And the fellowship is named to honor the memory of Mark Helmke, who in his work for then Senator Dick Luger was the prime mover behind the establishment of NED's Center for International Media Assistance, headed uh, now by Mark Nelson, who will moderate our second panel. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Paul Helmke, Professor Helmke, in SPIA, 
and Mark's brother for lending us his expertise and joining us today as the moderator Thank of the opening panel. And that brings me to the third part of our partnership, was an with, which is an internship for SGIS students at NED. And with us to say more about that is one of our first NED SGIS interns who comes to us from Mexico City via Fishers, Indiana, just up the road, Andrea Vega Utico. Uh, appropriately enough, Andrea is a double major in international studies and journalism with a minor in Chinese. Uh, Andrea, you probably know this, but um, uh, you've got great reviews from our NED uh, colleagues and set a high bar for the students who will follow you. So please join me in welcoming Andrea. I am both an SGIS and a media school major, which is where really I can bridge my two interests for international affairs and media. Um, I'm originally from Mexico City, which is kind of where my, my passion for international studies comes from. But I was first introduced uh, to the National Endowment for Democracy through SGIS when they um, made available this internship. I applied and thankfully um, I was able to spend last summer interning with SEMA, the Center for International Media Assistance. Um, I was there for a few months and I was able to learn about the world of media development and the great efforts that SEMA does um, every day. They uh, support the development of independent media worldwide. Uh, specifically when I was there, I was looking at how there's a threat of independent media posed in Africa due to Chinese um, investments. Um, I, have a very, I, have an in, I have a regional interest for China and it's my Chinese major, uh, minor. And um, I was able to learn a lot. I read their extensive reports that they publish um, almost every month. And uh, I highly recommend this internship to anyone. And from that, it's actually sparked an interest for media freedom, media development. Um, coming back, I became the president of a newly established organization called Reporters Without Borders at IU. Um, it is still really new, but it's, uh, it's an interest that sparked um, with SEMA, and I'm hoping to develop that more. And um, we have really two really great panels today, and uh, with some from some uh, Raving Fasal fellows, which I think is one of the best parts about the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, they bring in leading experts in their field um, from all around the world, um, and I know, and we have the pleasure of speaking from some, uh, hearing from, hearing some of them speak today. While I was in the summer, um, I was talking to a separate cohort um, from the spring, but they're excellent. They range from democracy activists to journalists. Um, and they're really great, really knowledgeable. So I'm really looking forward to the, to the panels today. Um, and I'd like to thank Professor Helmke for moderating this panel. He was actually my professor freshman year. So it's really great to see how my professor, my internship, and my academics are all coming in together today. <laughs> We'll get started. Um, I'm Paul Helmke, and uh, I first just want to thank uh, Dean Feinstein and uh, SGIS, as well as National Endowment for Democracy, SEMA, for, for putting uh, on this conference, having done the, and for having done this in the past, uh, starting the fellowship, postdoctoral fellowship named after my brother. Um, my, my brother uh, was a longtime aide to Senator Richard Luger, as the dean said, uh, but before that, he was a reporter. And uh, uh, our family was, consists of lawyers and politicians, people that worked in government. And with my brother, we added the media to it. Uh, my grandfather uh, and I had represented one of the newspapers in Fort Wayne, Indiana for years. I, uh, before I became mayor of Fort Wayne, I, I taught media law in Fort Wayne. Uh, First Amendment issues have always been issues that, uh, that have concerned me. And, and growing up, I've always seen this intersection between the rule of law politics and government and the media and then the crucial role that all those uh, all those play in establishing a, a functional democracy. Uh, after I was mayor, I, I ended up, uh, uh, after a stint doing gun control, which uh, sadly we're still needing to do something about, uh, was shown by yesterday, but uh, came to, to IU to um, run a civic leader center and I teach classes on law and public policy and protest and dissent. So these topics, uh, uh, dealing with First Amendment, protest and dissent, uh, uh, the rule of law are things that are crucial. And uh, we've got a great panel today. Their brief bios are in the, in the program, so I won't waste time uh, reviewing that for you, but we cover 
a um, uh, number of countries and a number of uh, areas of focus, and uh, it should be an interesting discussion. Um, one of the things in on our uh, program is called media capture. So uh, I think we all know what that means in this context, but I did a quick Google search uh, this morning to see what came up when I, when I said media capture. And nine out of the ten first entries deal with the things I don't know how to do, which is how do you get different media on your phone, <laughs> and how can you stream something else or play another playlist some way. So to most people, I think when they talk about media capture, they're talking about something else. But clearly to, to us in this discussion today, it's the, the role of the media as an independent power, the fourth branch of government uh, uh, is the way that people sometimes talk about it. Um, in our country, we've got the First Amendment, we've got court cases that, uh, that uh, create strong barriers for uh, public officials and public figures to, to sue media. Uh, but in other countries, um, we don't necessarily have that in, in this country. It's under uh, challenge. So what I thought we'd start with is go through each panelist and briefly have them talk about what they see as the issue surrounding media capture in area of expertise. And we'll start out with Natali, uh, uh, who's been very active in Russia and fighting for uh, freedoms in Russia since she uh, was, was somewhat forced out a few years ago and uh, has been involved in a number of interesting things. But Natalia, tell us uh, your views on media capture in terms of your background in, in Russia. Thank you very much, Mr. Helmke, and uh, let me also uh, join with um, uh, thanking for this event. It's great to be here, uh, actually on my New Year's Eve. Uh, tomorrow is the uh, Oriental New Year. <laughs> and um, so since everybody started to introduce uh, themselves, and uh, it's uh, not just enough to have <laughs> the bias there, I'll, I'll tell you that, uh, well, uh, Putin and his uh, regime uh, captured my country, and first of all, they did it through uh, capture of media. <laughs> And I'll just uh, briefly tell my story. Of course, my uh, colleagues from NED, they know it, and I talked to some of you uh, today. But uh, five years ago, I had to flee from Russia um, on a 48-hour notice uh, because I was working for an American democracy promotion organization, International Republican Institute, chaired by Senator McCain. And um, it was never easy uh, to work uh, in Russia uh, all the years uh, prior to, to that exile. Uh, but of course, after the... Um, uh, when Putin got in power for the third time in 2012 and with all of new uh, repressive legislation and other things, it just uh, became absolutely impossible. So we had to leave. Um, as I said, I had uh, 48 hours to pack and leave. I can pack very fast. So <laughs> if anybody needs those skills, I can share them. Um, and um, so uh, since that uh, time, I continue my fight. I want my country back. It's my country. I miss it a lot. <laughs> and um, so um, probably very briefly how it happened. Um, uh, so media capture was the first thing that Putin did when he became president in 2000. Um, as a former KGB officer, and as we understand there are no former KGB officers, uh, he understands the value of information. And of course not in the sense that uh, he, is, he respects uh, freedom of speech or he believes in the First Amendment. Um, he believes that uh, whoever controls media um, controls what it says. And uh, whoever controls um, information rules the world. So uh, as soon as uh, Putin came into power, uh, first of the things he did, uh, he tried to uh, put, uh, he put under control three uh, major uh, TV networks. Well, uh, RTR, uh, which is now uh, Russia one, it already was a state television, uh, but it was a brutal takeover of uh, two other major TV networks, uh, ORT, which is now the first channel, and NTV. So this is how he started. Uh, then in subsequent years, uh, he just started to put more and more media under control, um, privately owned as well, and um, so uh, they just started to comply with him. And um, uh, so, uh, he uh, appoints, uh, even for media, in, um, so-called independent media outlets, uh, it, they, their leadership, uh, their owners and their uh, uh, editors of chief, uh, their general directors, they have to comply with uh, Kremlin-imposed uh, rules. And um, that's why, for example, one of the uh, prominent Russian journalists, Sergei Parhomenko, he believes that uh, journalism in Russia doesn't exist as, uh, as an industry. Um, 
and uh, even again, even uh, independent media they have to comply with the rules. And the, uh, the journalism continue to exist only thanks to just separate journalists, very brave enough to continue to be honest and to continue uh, write about things in an honest and professional way. Um, they even established an award with other uh, journalists uh, with the help of a famous Russian philanthropist uh, who is now in exile as well, Dmitry Zimin. They established an award uh, for the best journalists who continue uh, to be professionals. Uh, and uh, by now they awarded about 60 uh, people, not only from Moscow, St. Petersburg or other big cities, but really very, very many regional uh, people. And uh, so uh, the next uh, big wave of um, media capture happened uh, just on the eve and right after uh, big upheaval in Russia in 2011, 2012. We have uh, rallies of protest when many Russians went to the streets for the first time after the collapse of the Soviet Union. We were protesting, we, were, we, we wanted free and fair elections. Um, and um, so uh, there were several uh, just examples. Uh, on the eve of parliamentary elections, um, they, um, the authorities forced to uh, one of the uh, chief uh, editors of uh, Gazeta Ru, a very famous Russian newspaper, to resign only because uh, they started a joint project with Golas. It's an independent election watchdog. So after that, uh, some of uh, his colleagues uh, went uh, left as well. And by 2013, uh, they just finished the, um, the total capture of this uh, media outlet, uh, just ab absolutely restuffing um, uh, the uh, political uh, d uh, department. Uh, another example was when uh, Commerçant, uh, they uh, published a photo of a voting ballot with a um, very curse word against Putin's name. So after that, again, also the editor chief had to um, had to leave, and um, and it just uh, examples continue and continue. On the eve of um, annexation of Crimea, they uh, fired Galina Timchenko, uh, who was the editor chief of a very big uh, media outlet Lenta.ru. After that, so many uh, journalists, correspondents left Lenta, and they had to move um, offshore to Latvia and establish a new uh, independent media outlet, Medusa. Medusa is only two or three years old, but already it's uh, growing. It's uh, having like 9.5 million people. So uh, in all that, uh, it's interesting for me, it's a paradox for me to see how, um, uh, and uh, also all this media, um, they started to um, turn from being uh, just a complying with the Kremlin, being their supporters uh, uh, just with uh, some biased information to becoming more and more active participants of this disinformation war. Uh, Russia Today, Sputnik, many other media outlets that were created where it was done, uh, as I said, to shatter um, the Western monopoly on truth, as they say. Um, Margarita Simonian, chief editor of uh, RT, uh, used to be Russia Today, uh, she said that uh, there is no truth, there are only interpretations. And even Putin himself, uh, in his interview to RT, said that, well, your task is to break this uh, monopoly, uh, Anglo-Saxon monopoly on information streams. Uh -huh. So this is <laughs> what they believe. Um, and uh, it's interesting, for a paradox for me to see how um, inside Russia it's a very single, um, unchallenged message, uh, quite primitive, uh, just to uh, unite, to consolidate uh, population around uh, Putin's system. Uh, and how sophisticated they are abroad, <laughs> uh, with RT, with the Sputnik, but also the Kremlin established this uh, famous uh, factory of trolls. Um, and uh, they don't do, they don't demand this uh, monopoly on the, like alternative monopoly on the truth, but they, try to confuse, try to spread all these false messages, um, muddy as a narrative, uh, just to make people here in the West to under, uh, not to trust the uh, media, not to trust procedures, not to trust dem <laughs> democracy, elections, and so on and so forth. So it's quite surprising for me uh, to see all that. Uh, so, but uh, what is the good news in, in this? Um, probably, yeah, I'll, I'll stop because I cannot talk <laughs> <laughs> forever, <laughs> just uh, so that we could uh, have yeah. some discussion, yes. Uh, good news and all that is that Putin is quite an outdated dictator. He believes only in one medium, TV. And um, 
Well, we can, uh, it's uh, easily explained. Um, e even his press secretary, Dmitry Peskov, says that he doesn't use internet at all. So the people in his circle understand the power of internet, especially, <laughs> and its significance for Russia, but he, he probably himself doesn't. Uh, TV, television made Putin. He was so insignificant, so plain uh, before, just a regular KGB case officer in Dresden, and then just a bored bureaucrat. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, TV made him a superstar, a global leader, um, uh, unifying entire American forces, protecting traditional values, a bare-chested macho that he who uh, um, wrestles with tigers, uh, <laughs> flies with birds. It's not it's not a joke. It's really, or when he dives, he immediately finds uh, two thousand um, um, year old uh, amphora. <laughs> so, of course, he, he believes only in this in in, in television as his medium. And uh, also another thing is why it's understandable because his electorate is there. It's people who really vote for him there on TV. Good news for us that. Uh, um, Especially the events of the last year showed that Russian youth is not on TV. And while the Kremlin ports billions of dollars into television, Russian youth just they don't watch it. They are on internet, on social media. <laughs> Even uh, those uh, actually last year showed that both uh, Russian authorities and Russian uh, opposition underestimated Russian youth. <coughs> and they are uh, taking all the information from, again, from the global net. <laughs> Um, and uh, so uh, in this regard, it's very important for, uh, for us to make sure that Internet is still alive there. It's, uh, uh, Russian authorities started to look at Chinese uh, example more and more. <laughs> and uh, so I think this is our future. And we can talk more about right. questions. Yeah. Who, who would have ever thought TV in a reality TV star would, would help politically? I, 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 <laughs> when do you know? Um, the, uh, but uh, let, let, let's move on to Shanthi, background with China, a lot of background with the internet particularly. Uh, uh, you know, some people think that uh, with the net, uh, internet, that that's uh, going to take away this possibility of media control. What are your, what are your thoughts on, on the issue from your background? So actually I thought Natalia made a number of interesting points that maybe I can pick up on. I mean, first, sure. the idea that uh, Putin, you said Putin is an outdated dictator. And I guess by way of contrast, I would say that the leadership of the Communist Party of China are perhaps exactly the opposite. And uh, I'll give you a few reasons why I would put it in this way. But first, let's back up a bit. For those who are not familiar with how media and the internet have evolved within China, you might have heard of this term, the Great Firewall, which refers to sort of the broad system of censorship that exists to contain and manage the kind of information that's available within China. What I found is when people hear this term, the Great Firewall, you immediately think of a, of a, you know, a very harsh, draconian kind of environment uh, where very little information can get through. Um, and in fact, what's happened over the years as the internet has penetrated China and has, as media has continued to develop, so you've had a number of very interesting developments. And actually, in many respects now, the use of mobile technology, the seamless integration of the internet with um, online shopping services, with uh, all kinds of different services, in many ways, what's happening within China is far advanced, uh, and it, it's actually gone beyond what exists in many liberalized industrial democracies. Um, but there are several facets of that, of that that are worth understanding a little bit more. The first is sort of thinking about the technology. So the way that the Chinese leadership thought about the penetration of technology was actually for them quite insightful. And they anticipated that the diffusion of the internet and related technologies would actually probably have some kind of destabilizing political impact that they wanted to avoid. So from the very beginning, in contrast with what happened in Russia, as I understand, they actually planned for this. And they made sure that they not only had control of the pipes, but that they essentially were able to manage at various levels of the process the way that the internet would roll out through the internet service providers, and finally, ultimately, all the way down to the user level. The second aspect uh, of that is that it was never only about the technology. So actually, you have to look at it, uh, and Paul, you know, you mentioned earlier sort of the, the 
nexus of rule of law and media and freedom of expression. And I think what you see within China is the development of a very sophisticated system of redundancy almost, mm -hmm. where censorship is built into so many layers that it encourages self-censorship on the part of people who are expressing themselves through the media or who are using the internet or social media in many different forms. Again, social media is exploding within China. It's just not the case that you would go there and you know, you'd find yourself in some kind of information desert. The challenge is finding any politically salient information. And by politically salient, I would say information that may prove uh, politically sensitive to the Chinese government. That would include any mention of uh, Tiananmen Square. It would include mention of Tibet in ways that the government finds problematic. Uh, it would include any mention of Taiwan as an independent political uh, entity. Um, those are sort of the three big guardrails, but, but there are lots of other topics within China that are essentially off limits. And so what you find is that the people that are using media, that are either writing within the media or that are using the internet as citizen journalists or just simply as social media users, they know where those lines are. And typically, they will self-censor and not express opinions about those things. Of course, that's not everybody. And you do have some debate, but it always takes place within parameters that generally the government has set. And if debate starts to edge beyond those comfort lines, uh, if it starts to take on a tenor that seems to perhaps be threatening, uh, censors uh, within the technology companies themselves or in the government will work to shut that down. So that brings me to my next point, which is um, it's the technology. It's not only the technology, and it is it has evolved to be a large uh, to a large extent about the way that the Chinese government works with its homegrown internet and technology companies to create a space that uh, is politically manageable. They, you know, I think several years ago, if you were watching the evolution of media within China, and you, you would have seen several years ago that uh, the party actually loosened its control a little bit, and it allowed for private ownership of some media outlets, and it allowed for all these internet companies to bloom and to actually become quite powerful. Um, and you might think, you know, hey, maybe there's more opportunity for politically um, independent information to circulate within China. But what's happened is that as these internet companies have grown and they've become powerful, they've done so because they've been allowed to grow by the state, by the government. And they ultimately know that if they ever run afoul of the government, uh, their licenses can be taken away, they may get somehow identified in an anti-corruption investigation. There are many levers that the state has over these new private companies that it can pull and use those to control uh, the domestic media and information environment. So that's a very brief and simplified outline of the way that I see uh, media and information being controlled within China. And I'll just mention by way of conclusion, and we can get back into it later, that what I find concerning is that this model is now extending beyond China itself. That we now see this idea that the Chinese government will be able to put pressure on outside companies, on outside civil society actors, on universities, outside of China to avoid those sensitive issues. Um, and that, I believe, is impinging on freedom of expression outside of China as well. And it's why I think those issues need to be brought to light in discussions of media capture. Just curious, you, you, you talked about Taiwan, Tibet, um, Tiananmen, with three yeah. T's. How about North Korea? Can well, I, I mean, typically uh, it depends on how you frame it. I think any subject can be potentially sensitive. It just depends on how it's framed. I mean, North Korea can be portrayed in a very positive light, and you could talk about it. Uh, similarly, I think if you talked about Tibet as an integral part of China and you talked about all the wonderful things that the Chinese government is doing in Tibet, that is not off. That is also fine. So it's all about how you address the, the topic. Okay. Gabor, you've been in politics in Hungary, part of the, the, the Hungarian parliament. Uh, you've uh, written perceptively, read some articles that you wrote about uh, uh, analyzing class in terms of the Trump election as well as uh, the rise of Orban in, in Hungary. What are your uh, observations on media capture? Yeah, thank you, thank you very yeah. much for the uh, opportunity. Um, yeah, I myself am not uh, like a media expert, but I think I have a few thoughts to, to contribute to the, to the, to the discussion. Um, 
it was very interesting to to hear how technologically sophisticated uh, the Chinese approach to media is. Uh, I think that the Hungarian way is less uh, technological, but nonetheless, I would say quite uh, perversive. And uh, there are estimates that uh, by now, uh, ninety percent of uh, media outlets in Hungary are controlled by the government, um, which is a very, very significant development uh, considering that just a few years ago uh, it was a more or less pluralistic media system that we had in, uh, in the country. Um, I wouldn't say that every media outlet was independent. It was, uh, you had uh, politically driven, power-oriented media outlets in Hungary uh, from, from the system change, from the regime change on, uh, from the early 90s on. Uh, but you also had uh, public service, uh, and you also had a significant share of profit-oriented uh, media outlets, uh, most of them owned by foreign uh, Swiss, German, Austrian uh, media corporations. So this resulted in a, in a rather pluralistic media system, but this has dramatically changed over the last um, couple of years. And uh, I found that... The, Stiglitz has uh, contributed to this uh, booklet by Sima on media capture, and he differentiated between uh, four different types of media capture, and I found that very useful because I think all of them are happening in Hungary. Um, the first, he's talking about censorship. And you would think that this was a thing of the past, of the socialist past, and, and certainly um, um, its relevance is... Uh, um, is not comparable to the, 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 the system of socialist censorship before 1990, but it's, it's there. Um, Fidesz established a new, uh, so you might know that in, two, in 2010, Viktor Orban was elected in Hungary as new prime minister with a two-thirds majority, which gave, gave him uh, a power basically to completely restructure the institutional landscape of the country. And a part of this was to uh, increase control over, uh, over the media. And one of the very first steps was to, uh, uh, to create a new media authority, in, uh, which was um, seen by many as a, as a tool to, to increase or inter reintroduce censorship. And indeed, there are some vague uh, phrases in, in the law about uh, that the media must not uh, offend uh, the, the, the majority of the population, for example, or that it must serve the community. And um, some might argue that this induces a certain level of uh, self-censorship. But I would also argue that is, this is uh, meant to create a deliberately vague uh, environment. Um, and there are also quite hefty fines that the new authority uh, can, um, you know, can use uh, if, if one... Uh, uh, violates these uh, these newly established uh, principles, and, and people are afraid of uh, of getting fined. So, so, so this is the the new system of, of censorship. But I would say that this is the still the least important way of capturing the media in Hungary. There's another uh, aspect which uh, Stiglitz has called uh, cognitive capture, which is uh, basically people behave in a certain way. They perceive. Uh, their own interests uh, uh, in, a, in a certain way that not, does not necessarily collude with the, with the public interest. And let me just give you one example. There is, a, as, uh, in a, is an online media outlet, uh, the, the most popular one, um, which is owned by, um, by, by a Hungarian financial investor who also happens to be in uh, close relationship with the post-2010 Orban government. Um, and uh, he, he lobbied heavily uh, for the restructuring of the Hungarian financial sector. And uh, as the media sector, the financial sector was owned by foreign investors mostly. So this, this Hungarian guy was lobbying to, to kick out some of the foreign investors so that he can, can, uh, can increase his own share. And through various measures, the government has aided him. Uh, and uh, um, of course, this went against existing property rights. And this was quite a nasty procedure trying to force out some of the investors. And this, uh, 
this financial investor was uh, heavily implicated in this. And now journalists have started to write about this, how this goes against the law, how, how this goes against the constitution. But the very media outlet that was owned by this guy has not written a single word on this. So this would be a typical case of, of uh, cognitive capture, I would say, where, uh, where uh, people are, are not, uh, they don't dare to go against uh, what they perceive is, is, is the interest of, of, of the owners. A third type of uh, control is, is um, basically financial incentives. Uh, and the state has multiple ways to, to, to interfere in the financial incentive structure of, of the media. And perhaps the most important is state advertisement in, in, in Hungary. And uh, between 2008 and 2012 or 13, the, the advertisement uh, revenue of, of traditional media has decreased significantly, some say by 40%, which has helped the state to increase its overall share in the advertisement market in Hungary. And some say that it went up from 3% to 15%. 15% of the advertisement market is directly linked to the state. It gives a, a significant leverage uh, to control what's written. And what's more important, even private investors see the state. They look where the state is advertising and they think that they should follow the state. So the state is sort of indirectly also governing the market because private investors, private advertisers, they fear that if they advertise in the wrong media outlets, they might, uh, they might, might get fined or they, they might get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So state advertisement is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a crucial uh, thing here. But there was uh, another case, uh, which was another way to interfere in the financial incentive uh, structure when the state uh, hindered the, the merger of two important uh, media uh, conglomerates in, in Hungary, both foreign owned, one a Swiss, one a German company owning significant chunks of regional and national uh, media outlets. Now the newly established media authority said you cannot do that. Uh, and these foreign investors thought that, uh, well, they cannot increase their profitability in a way as they would want to. So they started to sell uh, their, their assets because uh, the state interfered in the profitability of, of, of their companies. And this leads to the fourth, uh, and perhaps I would say the most, by far the most important way of interfering uh, in media in Hungary, which is, which is ownership. But as you can see, the state, through various measures, uh, uh, aids uh, the private investors who he sees as, as, as friendly to, to the government. This hasn't started in 2010. Uh, it, it started way before, and uh, just as in, in, in Russia, Hungarian, uh, uh, let's say the Hungarian right-wing politicians always uh, thought that there's no truth, and uh, there's the only opinion, and, and it's all, only the liberals who say that there's such a thing as neutrality, and they perceive the media to be uh, dominated by, by liberals, and they had this uh, uh, fierce uh, drive to establish their own media empire, and they have started doing so uh, during the 90s already. But as I said, there were other politically motivated media outlets, and there were foreign investors as well, so it was a pluralistic system. But uh, Fidesz has gained foothold in local governments already during the 2000s. And what they did was very innovative. They used these local governments to found uh, new right-wing uh, media outlets owned by uh, right-wing oligarchs connected to Fidesz. Meanwhile, the socialists were in government and they weren't really able to do anything. And then what happened was when they uh, were elected, uh, then they used the national funds and, and the national system to, to, uh, to aid um, government-friendly uh, oligarchs. Um, so the result is that by now, um, around, as I've said, around 90% of, of media is, is either owned or directly controlled by someone um, uh, related to, to the government, which I think uh, significantly influences the chances of, of, uh, of getting rid of this uh, authoritarian regime that we have in Hungary. Okay. Liz, you've... Um you focused uh, a lot on Brazil, 
and uh, have talked not so much about necessarily direct government control in the way that we've heard here, but uh, sort of how oligarchies or, or, or private ownership, uh, in, in effect, uh, captures it and, and works with the government uh, to, to do things. Tell, tell us about the perspective you've learned about in, in Brazil and in, in your research. Sure. So there's been a lot of research that's been done in countries at the national level, but one of the things that gets overlooked, particularly in a country like the United States or Brazil that are federal and have state government that's elected, is what's going on with the local media. And so um, a few years ago, there was a really interesting report by Reporters Without Borders um, in which they said that Brazil is the country of 30 Berlusconis. Um, so Berlusconi, the reference to the Italian prime minister, former prime minister, perhaps soon to be prime minister, um, who owns a huge, you know, he's a big media. <coughs> and so, in fact, this quote is actually an underestimate. Um, in 2015, there was a campaign to raise awareness of politicians who directly owned media, and it went against 40 members of Congress, so either the Senate or the Chamber of Deputies, whose names were directly listed as partners. So that's just the most obvious, and that's actually prohibited by the Constitution. They're not supposed to have any kind of right to broadcast. Um, but then when you start to look at the people whose names aren't directly on it, or who are governors, or state deputies, or mayors, the problem gets much more insidious. Um, so we've been working on trying to identify you know, the most popular media and who owns them and then who's behind them. So they, they actually even have a term in Brazil called laranja, which is just the word for the fruit orange. Um, that's used to explain somebody who's basically listed. They pay the bills, they do all this stuff, but they're not the person who actually owns it. So politicians frequently use this. But um, just to give you a couple of examples, if there's a a small state in the northeast of Brazil called Serra. There's four to five major net, like national networks in Brazil, but they mostly are, have local affiliates. And so in this state, there's two media companies, but if you pay attention, they're actually owned by the same family through marriage. And they control three of the four networks, the affiliates in that state. Um, in some other states, uh, they're in Maranhão, which is a bigger state in the Northeast also. Basically, all four networks are owned by four different political families. And these families were able to get the broadcast license back around the time of the dictatorship, um, because the dictatorship worked with them in the period immediately after. And they've held on to them. And then their families continue to be politicians. So it's hard to know which way the arrow goes. but. Um, they basically control the media in the state. Their son then goes on to be the mayor and then the governor. Um, and there is a bit of evidence that in these states, this is something I would have to explore, um, that they perform more poorly in providing uh, public goods, that there might be greater corruption, lots of things that you, you might suspect if people own the media. So we haven't done content analysis to make sure that they're biased, but we suspect that that's probably a problem. There have, however, been studies. The problem goes all the way down to community radio, which is actually quite important in Brazil. Um, and for instance, in the last election, there were 216 candidates who owned media. Um, 94 of them won, which I think is, I have the number somewhere, but like a 45%, 43.5% success rate compared to only a 34.6% success rate of the rest of the candidates. Um, so it helps them get reelected, and that's actually like a statistically significant difference. Um, you know, among all mayors, it's a small group, but if you get media, it pretty much secures you a long time in power. The uh, this is kind of a discouraging <laughs> conversation. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, it, are, are there any? Signs of hope. I mean, uh, you know, uh, any, anything good coming out, or anything good that you know others can do to, to, to maybe help the situation. Just any of you. Uh, it's just been very uh, interesting to see how these uh, authoritarian or authoritarian leaning regimes how they 
just learn from each other, just very often just copy paste, you know, I can see so many similarities with the how they do sales, uh, censorship and self censorship and all this, uh, how they uh, try to influence the situation with uh, uh, stripping of advertising if uh, <laughs> they don't like uh, some media outlets and things like that. But again, at the same time, I don't know, I'm very hopeful <laughs> and, okay. and uh, I believe in technologies, I believe in use power i believe in uh, again that uh, we also can learn from each other and uh, how in this such a uh, age of uh, <laughs> again of advanced technologies we, we can do so much uh, just examples um despite all these um, closures takeovers captures restrictions uh, repressive legislations all these legal traps that russian government imposes on uh, journalism journalists in, inside and uh, media outlets inside Russia or very often they had to flee from the country and uh, uh, start working for media Western media outlets like Masha Gessen in New York or Yulev Yofa in the Atlantic uh, um, and many others or start, uh, making their startups offshore like Medusa in uh, the Balk in Latvia or uh, the Bell in uh, California and things like that they continue doing <laughs> even offshore um, at the same time so much uh, and like, I'm really very inspired by all those people inside the country who are brave enough again to, to speak up. And uh, all the stories that we discuss here in the Western media, they have just been amplified uh, by the Western media. But in fact, all these stories were investigated by journalists, by activists. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, a very good friend of mine, uh, Anastasia uh, Alexandra Gromazhapova, she uh, used to work for St. Petersburg uh, branch of uh, Nova Gazeta investigative uh, newspaper. She's now um, outside of the country, uh, working for Radio Liberty in Prague. But she was the first one to discover this uh, Kremlin factory of trolls, and she wrote about it, and after that it was picked up <laughs> in Western media. Or uh, Lev Schlossberg also wrote for um, uh, Pskov um, regional deputy, uh, wrote in the uh, Nova Gazeta investigation uh, about um, the troops in eastern Ukraine, and it was the first time, uh, because mm -hmm. before that the Kremlin was absolutely denying, <laughs> and they, they still <laughs> do, but uh, after that there were so many uh, evidences that yes, uh, it's, it's not just vacation and soldiers there, <laughs> but it's <laughs> actually like true Russian troops uh, mm -hmm. in, in eastern Ukraine, um, things like that, and uh, I think, again, we c only solidarity helps, only this, uh, how we, how fast we can also react, yes, they are smart enough to oversmart them. <laughs> <laughs> Any other signs of hope? So I will say that over the years in China, you've, it, depending on the degree of political openness allowed by the leadership, you will see tremendous amounts of improvisation and innovation on the part of media professionals who will try to get around the censorship in different ways or will try to report on stories in different ways so that they can walk right up to the line and get some more independent information out and yet try not to run afoul of the authorities. And oftentimes it's within these authoritarian environments that you see this kind of improvisation and true innovation. Um, so that does give me some hope, although I think what is, I don't want to get back to the negative side again, but to me what is the, the chilling aspect of what's happening in China is, is the extent to which it's no longer about censorship but about surveillance as well. And I think that the surveillance aspect is poorly understood, but it's something that is increasingly becoming relevant. That people, uh, because the technology has become so all-pervasive, the state is able to use it to really kind of create this mass chilling effect of the population in ways that was not possible before you had this. And I can go into great detail about the evolution of smart cities in China and facial recognition technology, and I'm sure some of you have seen stories about this, but that's a new development that makes it harder for that kind of innovation to take place. Um, I will say that I think in democracies, it, um, we could learn from that kind of innovation and creative thinking, though, it, particularly when we're thinking about how to deal with disinformation and how to deal with these mm -hmm. issues. In a way, many in industrialized liberal democracies have become slightly complacent, maybe not slightly. Mm -hmm. And I think it's incumbent upon citizens of democracies to become better educated, to become mm -hmm. better informed about information and the way, that, the way that it travels. And to not simply be skeptical across the board, but to really take the time to think about these issues. It's something that we have not emphasized in our democracies in recent <laughs> years, but I think those issues really need to be more at the forefront now. Good well, <laughs> it's hard to be optimistic if you're a Hungarian. <laughs> well, of course there are signs of hope, and I've just read a piece of news that um, 
the last remaining big foreign investor in the in the country, who who are basically the only ones who pursue a purely profit oriented uh, logic, uh, which is good for uh, plurali pluralism. Um, they they are increasing their profits in the country, which is uh, to, to me quite astonishing because there was another uh, German investor owning another major commercial television and they were successfully kicked out uh, by the government. But this other one, RTL, they, they, they managed to, to stay. And uh, part of the reason was that they are refocusing on online media. And uh, n obviously, o online media is a double-edged sword because it erodes the profitability of, of, of traditional media, which is a concern, I think. But uh, it also opens up new possibilities. and uh, And the biggest uh, remaining or the most significant remaining pockets <coughs> of resistance, so to speak, are in online media in Hungary, partly foreign owned. But there are also new media outlets emerging. And this is another sign of innovation that are trying to, uh, to run a new business model based on micro donation and, and uh, micro financing. And they again can use uh, um, online fundraising tools uh, to get the get the funds uh, get the funds necessary, um, of course the online advertisement market is also harder to control because you have international mm -hmm. advertisement uh, agencies. But again, the problem is that large chunks of the population don't really have access to to online media, and especially small little towns uh, outside Budapest, uh, outside the capital, uh, they only have access to 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 media. Uh, either directly owned by the state or controlled by by uh, by right wing uh, oligarchs. So the question is if if uh, if online media and a few remaining uh, independent media outlets can generate uh, enough impetus to 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 create political change. And I think a political change will be needed to to again restructure the media landscape, which is so biased by now. So I think that's the like it's a it's a very absurd situation that you have to use the state and and massive state involvement to recreate sort of a, a more independent and more uh, more pluralistic uh, media I don't know how to do that but I don't think that without uh, state uh, and without uh, political change it, it would be uh, it would be possible in Hungary but there are signs of open pockets of resistance mm -hmm. here. Liz well, uh, I think one thing is that there are these small media watchdog yeah. NGOs that are trying to raise the issue. So this campaign to out the 40 members of Congress is a positive sign. Mm -hmm. It was in 2015. I, don't, I think they all still own the media, so it, it needs you know more time to be successful. Um, and there, I would say through some very negative news, it's evidence of positive news which is that Brazil, unfortunately, shows up on the list of most journalists killed yeah. almost every year. Mm -hmm. And this is because they're, and they're almost always in like small little towns, not in Rio or Sao Paulo. And these are bloggers, radio hosts, that are talking about corruption of local officials, talking about uh, the big industries like logging. And so they're obviously make you know reporting things that are getting them killed unfortunately but mm -hmm. they are there are people out there trying to get information out I'm, I'm, I'm curious in, from all your perspectives that you know sometimes I, 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 know, I know some people worry that uh, that the US politicians are learning the lessons from perhaps Russia China Hungary Brazil uh, instead of them learning what should be our lessons um, what you know is is there this is sort of a two uh, two way you can answer either way what what are there things that the US can be doing or that other you know outside actors can be doing to help the situation in in these different countries uh, back in the 50s there was radio free europe you know broadcast uh, you know at least real news into into uh, behind the iron curtain uh, you know is is there a modern modern version of that and on the flip side how do we prevent these lessons of media takeover, media control from infecting the U.S. political system more than it has? 
Well, Big questions, okay. But <laughs> well, with America and Radio Free Europe, they still exist, and actually there is even more funding for them to produce their content. The problem is that uh, the biggest problem is the distribution inside Russia. They don't have uh, absolutely equal uh, um, uh, chances as uh, RT has here, even though mm -hmm. RT was uh, <laughs> recognized as foreign agents and they were recognized as undesirable organizations and things like that. But absolutely, uh, you can go to any US uh, hotel, turn on TV, RT will be there. You go to any hotel in Russia, turn on TV, <laughs> Voice of America or Radio Liberal won't be there. Mm -hmm. So it should be probably the um, subject of negotiations on the diplomatic level. Each time uh, US diplomats meet mm -hmm. with any counterparts from Russia, they should raise this, give us the same uh, okay. chances. Okay. So negotiate it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that there's a modern equivalent of, you know, go and just broadcast it. I mean, maybe it's possible in certain environments to do it. But I think, you know, what we're encountering now is a global information environment that's unlike anything that we've had before. And platforms play a huge role in that, privately owned platforms like Facebook, Google, so on. And I think, you know, we have to understand the effect that these platforms can have in all sorts of different environments. So it's not a quick fix, but I think understanding the role that they play and how they condition the way people receive and impart information, both in closed environments and in democracies, you know, does it make, it, does it make us more receptive to disinformation, to not trust what we see, to mm -hmm. become less informed rather than better informed? Those are all hard questions um, that I think we are just starting to, to touch both in this country and in other countries. Um, and the second part of your question, you is, are, are, is, are perhaps, are we learning the law, or are not we, are, are some people in the U.S. learning, taking the, the wrong lessons? Are we seeing more, I mean, you've touched on a little bit, are we, uh, you know, by, by getting rid of net neutrality, by uh, seeing uh, concentrations of ownership of, of the media, are, are, is the U.S. going the way the wrong way, uh, following perhaps uh, the, the wrong examples and learning the, the, the wrong lessons from the, the dictators or, or others. I don't know that it's learning the wrong lessons, but I think you do see a generalized trend, not just in the U.S., but in many different countries towards this increasing concentration of ownership, which can have some negative effects if left mm -hmm. unexamined. I will say it's never been a better time to be a communications policy nerd with an emphasis on international affairs. Um, it is truly a fascinating area, and I don't just say that just because I kind of like to dabble at this intersection myself. I really feel like if you know something about communications policy and can apply that knowledge in a global context, this is absolutely mm -hmm. where these, these really important decisions and discussions about democracy are going to take place for the short to medium term. And it's a great place for everybody that's trying to decide on a major or a field of study. I, it's, you know, we need more knowledgeable people thinking about these issues. More, Liz? Well, uh, there are definitely ways to, uh, to help uh, private independent media to, to, to get stronger in, in countries like, like Hungary. And, and that, that has started to happen. And I think that's, uh, that's still crucial. Um, and uh, yeah, that must be part of the solution in, in many, many, many forms. Uh, it can be print media, it can be online. Um, yeah, but I had this uh, feeling that um, there must be institutional or, or public or political um, approaches to the problem as well, because um, the Hungarian state has ways to spend uh, money that I think there's just no way to match it uh, on a market basis. So there's no profitable entity that could uh, spend uh, comparable amounts of money on, uh, on communication as the Hungarian state does. So it's, there's the Hungarian state advertisement, which is uh, they, they've, the last year they spent uh, the amount of money, almost the same amount of money as the previous uh, so pre pre 2010 uh, socialist government has spent over four years of time um, and they, they, they spend an equal amount of money on, on, on the so-called public service media which is directly censored from from the party ha headquarter so it's uh, it's an immense amount of money and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not a media lawyer but <laughs> there should be ways to um, to try to uh, influence uh, and try to curtail the the state's role in uh, in in the media market especially i think uh, through the european union 
there should be ways to to try to try to stop it stop this and these are new new things that i i understand that it takes time to 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 learn the nuances and and and, and come up with uh, solutions but uh, neither should us nor should european politicians be afraid i mean you are anyway portrayed as the failing the decadent western powers in hungary so it cannot really become any worse so <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> please uh, please be <laughs> be more courageous <laughs> um, to address your question about the U.S., it seems to me that there's sort of like counteracting trends. So there's obviously a very negative trend accusing the media of all being fake news and this issue of people being in their little pockets on social media. That is also true of Brazil. It might surprise you that Brazilians actually use social media more than people in the U.S. Hmm. Um, so they suffer from the same things. But I think it's also raised a huge awareness and there's a reaction to it. I mean, I think, you know, we've had some of the best journalism in a while in the past couple of years. Certainly the best satires have been going on. <laughs> yeah. Which is actually, I think, very important. People underestimate mm -hmm. the power exactly. of satire. Um, so I don't know if they're getting the lessons directly from each other, but there's certainly things that, like we as academics can study the comparisons. Before, I mean, maybe we can get one or two questions from the audience, but I just wanted to ask uh, Natalia one thing. One of the issues, obviously, that, that's been in the news here has been, you know, alleged Russian interference with the elections. Uh, you were actually at an event with the, the Russian lawyer that met at Trump Toller in June of 16, uh, the next day or so. What, what's, what's going on? Or what, what are your observations about what's going on with uh, these Russian lawyers and the the McGinsky, the, the you know their their efforts against the um, I, I don't pronounce it right McGinsky the M M Act. Well, it's actually interesting how uh, the Russian government uses um, uh, uses all uh, these uh, Western democratic uh, institute procedures um, uh, here. They can easily. Uh, register an NGO, for example, in, and there is an NGO uh, with absolutely the same name as uh, the name of the law, Global Magnitsky Act. And they just, again, say that the lie <laughs> that they are, they were established only to improve uh, the U.S. and Russia relations to try to uh, get rid of this uh, ban for Americans to adopt Russian orphans mm -hmm. and things like that. But with this cover, they were actually uh, lobbying members of Congress. And uh, when Veselinska was, Natalia Veselinska, uh, she was one of them who was doing that mm -hmm. <laughs> openly. They use other things, uh, quite legal. Um, so one of our experts, um, Ilya Zaslavsky, uh, he actually uh, writes a project about the miners and he studies the profile uh, with, of uh, 100 uh, people uh, from the former Soviet Union who steal money in the Russian or Ukrainian or <laughs> Kazakh or other uh, budget, but uh, bring uh, to the West, bring this money to the West. And uh, there are 40 different levels of influence, how they do it, from absolutely illegal, like uh, political murders abroad, uh, bribing, laundering money, to just uh, ethically questionable. <laughs> and uh, so there are a lot of open avenues here. And very often, I don't know if the West is too naive or <laughs> too cynical or something like that, but um, they just, they can, again, register, they hire lobbies, they hire PR firms, they do many other things, like, <laughs> and uh, um, sometimes there is a belief that, okay, if they, like, trade with us, for example, they will learn our rules, they will comply with it. No, they bring their corrosive practices here, and slowly, but <laughs> surely, they just uh, corrupt uh, these um, institutions as well here. <laughs> Question or two before we finish the panel, Tyler. Professor, my name is Tyler Smith, and I'm from West Lafayette, Indiana. Um, my question is for Ms. Kalatik. Um, I understand um, through some discussions with some Chinese students that the prevalence of VPNs in China to get around the Great Firewall um, is pretty great. And my question is, if the government has the capabilities of blocking these VPNs, why do they allow the Great Firewall to be somewhat porous? Great question. Do you want me to answer yeah. now? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it actually, that's a great question, and it goes to the sophistication, I think, of the system, which is that the early, um, as the internet developed in its early years, uh, people in the leadership decided that it would be better to take an approach that would manage it and allow some porosity uh, while still controlling for overall political impact. 
And so it was a very deliberate kind of strategy. And actually, I think if you look at different countries around the world, you can find countries that didn't take that approach, that maybe tried to shut everything off. And uh, that caused a lot more frustration to build up. That said, uh, VPNs have become much more scarce if you're following this now in China. You know there's been a VPN crackdown. It's harder to get on VPNs. And significantly, there's been pressure put mm -hmm. on um, international companies that allow access to VPNs. So Apple pulled its VPNs from its app store within China. And that caused a big outrage because, you know, this is an international company. It's supposed to be operating according to certain principles, or at least we assume that. And yet, you know, it, it said, look, we're, we're being asked to pull VPNs from our app store. So, you know, it's, it, I think this kind of, again, goes to the sophistication and the layered approach that they have, whereby it's a combination of technology, some porosity to allow for some pressure valves, but at the end, um, you know, some pressure that can be put on the key actors that determine access, including private companies. More questions? No questions? Um, so, you know, some U.S. governments are interested in uh, the internal um, uh, approaches to issues related to democracy and free expression more than others. And I think it's fair to say the current administration, for the current administration, this is not a priority. So just to get a sense from, uh, and, in some, and in some cases, I would say that there's a there's a certain identification and um, uh, a degree of legitimization that some of the authoritarian governments feel by their perception of what's happening here. So I'm curious, maybe to our friends in Hungary, but for, for anybody, uh, how it looks from your perspective. Well, um, it's okay, we still have freedom of speech. <laughs> 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 Um, well, two things come to my mind. First is that uh, I remember that um, Viktor Orban was the first to uh, to endorse uh, Trump mm -hmm. um, very early on, uh, and they believed that with the new uh, Trump administration, uh, the U.S. Uh, Hungarian relationships would change. Now, this did not really happen uh, to that extent that they were. We're hoping it shows the multipolarity of of, uh, of the U.S. Uh, government, which is, I think, very important and something that the Hungarians don't really understand how that that could be. So there's still things to learn for the Americans uh, how to control properly <laughs> the, the the state. Um, the other thing is from a from a from a different different perspective is that. Um, now, having spent uh, five months here is, is uh, I was really, um, I would say, shocked by the manifold parallels between uh, Hungarian and U.S. politics. And uh, obviously there's learning uh, on the Hungarian side from, uh, uh, from different uh, political actors and, and campaign managers, but there are also uh, parallels in, the, in like the political economic background uh, that induce certain kind of political maneuvering uh, that is not directly related to the media, but, but obviously this happens using media and, and, and the more favorable the media environment is to uh, uh, fuel hatred against migration, for example, uh, you, you need a certain type of media to be able to, to do that. And in Hungary, it's, 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 uh, it's there. Uh, but you also need that to have a, a population that feels this kind of I don't know, existential and psychological threat, feeling of being left behind. And when I was uh, uh, traveling around West Virginia, I, I really felt that there are important similarities in the ways the industrialization impacts people there and impacts people in Hungary and creates a political momentum for politicians in alliance with media oligarchs to create a kind of political supply that resonates with the fear of, of, of these people. And this is something that is happening in the US and in Hungary to a, a much, uh, uh, so, 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 so to an extent that I haven't experienced in, in other Western, Western, uh, Western European countries. I don't know that this has answered your, your, your questions. These were two, two impressions I, I had, but just getting back to the multipolarity, I think, 
that that there, there's that this gives us hope as well. And as I've said previously, I think uh, I mean Hungary is member of the NATO. Just to, to say one thing, so I think there are diplomatic ways for the State Department and the U.S. government to influence uh, the behavior of not just Hungarian politicians but oligarchs in alliance with, with Hungarian politicians. Any other thoughts? Um, well, I, there's a book that just came out, and I'm drawing a blank on the title, but it's by two political scientists, uh, Levitsky and Zyblet. And so they're actually, this is the first time comparative politics, I think, is of use to the US. They're drawing a lot from Latin America and some other cases to sort of present the warning signs of threats to democracy. And this book has been getting a lot of attention, I think, even outside of political science. Um, so there is there's already studies coming out that are perhaps you know drawing from the misfortune of Latin America to give us some information. Anybody else? Any other questions? Take one more. Okay. So hi, my name is Morgan. I'm a graduate student who's studying the Russian um, the Russian and Eastern Pain Institute here at CHIS, and I wanted to ask you, Natalia. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping to do my thesis on Russian youth and how they, I guess, generation below mine. I'm in my mid 20s, so people that are teenagers now, how they use the internet and the media to shape their political beliefs. So, do you have any commentary about that? Because, on the one hand, I feel hopeful. Um, like you guys said, people I think are developing a media literacy. But the other hand, you see a lot of um, the consolidation of a lot of media forms and uh, you know, I guess the implication of messages coming from media. So, what do you think? What, what, the future of Russia needs look like. Um, Thank you for the question, really. One of my favorite, I would say. <laughs> um, actually, uh, I remember an, uh, an interview of a f um, former interim president of Kyrgyzstan, Rosa Tenbaeva, when she was asked a uh, few years later uh, what she was doing, and she said, I'm working with uh, four-year-olds now. Uh, and she was asked why, and she said, because we lost all other generations. And at first, it was like, really like, I was very shocked to, to think about it because Putin is in power for 18 years. This year there will be people who will go and vote, mm -hmm. if they go, because youth <laughs> don't vote that often, uh, that uh, knew only Putin as president. And it was very, a very scary uh, thought. But at the same time, uh, events, previous events, especially last year events, uh, showed that um, no, the situation is not that bad. Uh, Russian government adopted a lot of repressive laws, uh, anti, anti, anti everything, <laughs> a lot anti media as well. Uh, there are the laws are enough to put uh, everybody <laughs> to jail if they want. It, good uh, news is that there are not so many jails. <laughs> and uh, but uh, what the government does, they cherry pick uh, to show the signal and um, to, to so that people start to fear. And you can be in, in jail for a simple tweet, for a simple like, not even just your post, <laughs> your reposting. <laughs> Again, there are examples when uh, one person was uh, re reposting a map of all Mongolia, and he was accused in separatism. He's in jail for that, and things like that. Or just one person was in jail just for catching Pokemons. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. But, and so again, it's uh, showing signals. And for me, uh, among all these repressive laws, and actually the most uh, dangerous thing I thought was educational reform because uh, uh, what the, the Russian government was doing is putting more and more um, lessons of, on uh, uh, Russian or Orthodox religion or patriotism lessons or more physical uh, training <laughs> instead of uh, in cutting on literature, foreign languages, mathematics and things like that. And with all this huge uh, investment in again, TV propaganda, it seemed like the entire population is zombified, especially after Ukrainian events, it seemed like that. But then uh, good news was, uh, no, uh, Russian youth uh, take information not from, even not from schools even, <laughs> definitely not from TV. And the best news for me was that they're capable to critically think and to analyze and to compare and just to ask questions and to doubt and they're tired of Putin, many of them. <laughs> and I think if uh, he decides, uh, he looks at the um, example of uh, China a lot and they were already how they do it, they uh, use some trying balloons and some people would say from the government and from the parliament would say, oh, China example is so bad, we should follow, <laughs> so good, we should follow it. Um, but I think it will be like huge revolution if <laughs> Russian youth is deprived of internet at the moment. Uh, penetration of internet is huge, it's like almost everybody is on internet. Of course, uh, 
uh, it's excessive because some people are counted as active users only because they have an, an email account. Uh, but social media users huge. Uh, again, uh, with some, <laughs> uh, we should mention that uh, mostly it's Russian, uh, Russian social media that are very <laughs> heavily used. Uh, Facebook, Twitter are not that uh, popular. But still, uh, when uh, uh, Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, when he did his investigation um, last year about um, uh, corruption of Prime Minister Medvedev, uh, about all his yachts, palaces, and things like that, and he put it on YouTube, it was the first time when he was able to break through this bubble of all this, like supporters, people, all of us who know what is going on in Russia. He was able to reach a much bigger audience. Uh, right now, his, uh, that video was watched by 26 million people. And so many Russian uh, youth got so angry <laughs> about that, they went to the streets. Um, last year, we had two big uh, b b uh, protests, yeah, as well as a protest in March uh, after that video was released and in June. And uh, well, first of all, geography was very impressive in comparison of 2011, 2012, when we had rallies only in big cities. Uh, uh, this time it was like 200 cities uh, from uh, Kaliningrad to Vladivostok, even regions which we called uh, sleeping regions. But the most impressive for me was the age of the protesters from 13 years to 22 years. So it gives me hope. <laughs> The um, read a book recently called uh, "The Storm Before the Storm." It was about the fall of the Roman Republic before it fell, and uh, one of the one of the, the lines that stuck out for me was that uh, when the politicians started lying and nobody cared that they were lying, that was sort of the sign that they were they were going to fall. And uh, our system of uh, pushing for a marketplace of ideas and a strong media. Uh, playing a role in the marketplace of ideas and, and exposing the lies when there are lies, uh, saying that there is a truth out there, I think it's an important thing. This panel, they do a lot in their research and their work uh, of advancing that issue, and they've uh, spent a lot of time with us today. Let's give them a round of applause.